of there, come on in. Do you know, I was thinking what a funny old world we live in, apart from uh, the obvious pandemic. Uh, I read a lot of news online and then I regularly check what I have read against a fact-checking website which tells me who has been spinning a tall tale and who's skirting close to the truth. How sad that I no longer entirely trust what I'm told when I would have thought this was the perfect time for absolute honesty. Uh, as was ever the case, however, many politicians seem addicted to playing fast and loose with facts. Besides, hyperbole makes for better headlines. There's an old saying that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on her boots. Uh, try and discover the truth about who first said that and you'll find a host of opinions. There are those who are adamant it was Mark Twain. Well, it's smart enough for Twain, but it could also have been Winston Churchill. Or Thomas Jefferson. Or one of their wives who said it over breakfast and never got the credit. Uh, much of the world which I live in, when not confined to the house, uh, the world of show business, is not always home to rigorous truth. It's based not so much on lies as fantasies or, what can I call them, mild distortions. On the fringes of that is the world of celebrity, which I avoid at all costs, as it is built entirely on a foundation of make-believe. Possibly the most extreme example of this is an American woman called Jocelyn Perisset, better known as Jocelyn Wilderstein, a name she gathered to herself on this day in 1978 when she married billionaire art dealer and businessman Alec Wildenstein. Uh, Jocelyn was born in Switzerland. Her dad worked in a shop selling sports goods, which given the Swiss penchant for fitness was probably a very nice gig. For Jocelyn, however, it wasn't enough. By 17, she was dating her first movie producer, then another, and then she met Alec at a shooting weekend, as you do. Uh, Jocelyn was a skilled hunter and they bonded over Oh, I don't know, being able to kill things accurately. Uh, the new Mrs. Wildenstein was very pretty. There are photos of her from the 1970s where she looks like what we used to call a fresh-faced model. Then things started to go wrong, and Jocelyn may or may not have decided to have some plastic surgery. Like Donald Trump, I'm not a doctor. All I know is that Jocelyn's face seemed to change radically, uh, with some suggesting she had undergone a brow lift, a facelift, lip plumping, fat grafting, and or cheek implants, upper and lower eyelid surgery, and canthopexy, a procedure I'd never heard of, uh, which apparently elevates the eyes to make them look more like the lynx which she kept as a pet. So the press started calling her Catwoman, and certainly there was a curiously feline look about her, like an actress doing too much method acting in order to get into the cast of The Lion King. Now, I try never to look at celebrity photos, but these are honestly rather compelling. Nevertheless, Jocelyn furiously denied that she had ever had any surgical help. She said she'd always looked this way. It was due to her Swiss background. And all that had happened over the years was that she'd lost a certain freshness. I am actually quoting here. Uh, things went downhill. In 1999, she and Alex divorced after he accidentally slept with a 19-year-old Russian model in the family home. As her settlement, Jocelyn received $2.5 billion plus $100 million each year for the following 13 years, with the judge stipulating that she couldn't use any alimony payments for further cosmetic surgery, even though, you know, she hadn't had any. But you know what expenses can be like? By 2018, she was bankrupt. Now, for a while, she dated fashion designer Lloyd Klein, and a pleasingly celebrity-like manner both were arrested for altercations at their Trump World Tower residence. Of course it was Trump World Tower. What other neighbours would he have? Both were cleared of their charges, which apparently did not stem from a late-night fight, but were the combined sound of a dish exploding on the stove and loud sex noises. And who hasn't had one of those evenings? So what's the truth in all this? Well, it, it doesn't actually matter. It's none of our business. It's just that human beings are drawn to extreme stories. Even my deep disinterest in celebrity led me to read this whole sorry saga, which is packed with cloudy truth. I dislike dishonesty intensely, Although I am aware that occasionally a lie might save the day. It was today in 1943 that the body of a dead Royal Marine acting major by the name of William Martin was picked up from the water off Huelva on the southern Spanish coast. On his corpse were a number of personal items, including stamps, keys, a photo of a woman and a letter about his overdraft. In addition, he also carried a briefcase chained to his coat belt, which contained correspondence between two British generals which suggested that the Allies planned to feign an invasion of Sicily while actually invading Greece and Sardinia. Now, Spain was theoretically neutral, 
but they had a curious concept of neutrality, for they shared this information with German military intelligence before returning the original correspondence to the British. Based on this knowledge, the Germans shifted reinforcements to Greece and Sardinia, and none to Sicily. That small Italian island was the part of Europe Winston Churchill referred to as its soft underbelly. And on the 9th of July, the Allies invaded Sicily, thus beginning the Italian campaign, which would eventually see the surrender of German armed forces in Italy. The initial success was entirely based on a lie. There was no acting Major William Martin. The body, which Spanish fishermen had pulled from the sea, was that of Glyndor Michael, a tramp who very sadly had died from eating rat poison. He was part of an elaborate ruse known as Operation Mincemeat. Deliberately planting fake documents to be discovered by the enemy is known as the Haversack Ruse, and there are plenty of examples of it in history. Finding a body to use is usually the tricky part. Uh, there were plenty of deceased at the time, but each one quite rightly had to be accounted for. What was needed was a corpse which no one would claim. Someone like a tramp called Glyndor Michael, who was then delivered to his job as a post-mortem courier by the submarine HMS Seraph. It is, I have to say, a typically British story which is well worth reading, in which the men preparing Michael's body couldn't get his boots on because they had frozen in the mortuary and everyone had to scramble about looking for an electric fire to defrost them. The result of this lie is impossible to calculate. The estimate is that thousands of lives were saved. One of the officers in charge of the operation described Glyndor Michael as simply a bit of a ne'er-do-well and declared that the only worthwhile thing he'd ever done, he did after his death. My heart goes out to that unclaimed man whose grave lies in Huelva, where in 1997 a postscript was finally added to his tombstone telling the world that he had served as Major William Martin, R.M. He was part of a lie, but it was a good one. Telling the truth is a good idea, for today is National Honesty Day. I'll be honest, it's a kind of fake holiday. It was invented by a writer called M. Hirsch Goldberg, who had written a book about lying in history. He was probably just trying to sell more copies, but I like the idea of national honesty. There is much to be said for being straightforward, uh, so I'm going to be. Uh, these daily broadcasts began when Alex Bell and I were just leaving the television studios where we had both just finished recording a show we are part of called QI. That had been an odd day, because instead of recording our shows with an audience of 600, there had been no one there apart from the cast and crew. Alex is one of the genius elves on the show, and as we parted, we had no idea that this lockdown was going to be for more than three weeks. Let's make something we agreed to keep people occupied. We began, me writing and broadcasting, Alex editing, and my wonderful wife Debbie taking time out to do absolutely everything else. For the past six weeks, we have broadcast every day with everyone working entirely for free, but here is the truth. It has been huge fun, but it is all consuming, and the three of us need to find a new way forward if we're in for the long haul. Debbie is a big part of a team who run a mental health charity, which she needs to do every day, and both Alex and I are supposed to be doing other work. We all hope that a few people have found some respite from present troubles in looking at facts from the past. We've loved doing it and we won't stop. Uh, it's just not going to be every day. Uh, from now on, we'll post some new thoughts on history every Friday for the foreseeable future. Please tell your friends. Perhaps they might enjoy the many hours there now are of past recordings, uh, which are part of Vox Talks. Uh, just so you know, any monies raised from advertising is going to go to the Trussell Trust, who support a nationwide network of food banks. And every day, please know I would hug you if I could. I'll be back on Friday. Take care. Be kind.